Welcome to First Christian Church's Adult Fellowship Bible Study. We are now in an in-depth study of Colossians, uh, with this being lesson number three. Uh, after lesson number one, which was an introductory general overview uh, of the book, and lesson number two, uh, which is verses three through eight, was a prayer of thanksgiving. However, those verses uh, three through eight from the from lesson number two are germane to today also, as the prayer the today session is a covering a prayer of intercession, uh, which takes off actually in the middle of that other uh, uh, verses. In the Greek, all of today's material is a single sentence, and it's a. Uh, no, that's the way it's found in the majority of old Greek manuscripts. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's read Colossians chapter 1 verses 9 through 12 in the New Revised Standard Version. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, as you bear fruit in every good work, and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from His glorious power, and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience, while, in, while joyfully giving thanks to the Father, who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Dr. Scott McKnight opens his commentary on this, uh, these verses with this. At the heart of Paul's ministry was prayer for the churches, end quote. So here Paul is taking uh, ministerial ownership, several scholars say, of this Colossian church that he did not found. Some scholars argue if this letter is by an imitator of Paul, clearly such a prayer uh, opening and intercessory at this would be a worthy approach that would capture of the audience's attention and relate to Paul. Nearly all scholars note that this prayer is actually a continuation of the prayer that started back there in verse 3, but the first five verses that we covered last time is a prayer of thanksgiving. Dr. Michael Bird says the author just shifts in that prayer to an intercession mode. He also notes at this point, there is emphasis and urgency not present in the thanksgiving portion of the prayer. At the end of this prayer, the last two verses shifts into a digression related to the Messiah and redemption that continues on through verse 23, which will be our lesson number four uh, covered in our session after this. Dr. Margaret, Mar, excuse me, Dr. Margaret McDonald teaches that verse 9 in today's reading is closely tied uh, to that prayer of the previous verses with the wording, because of this, or translated elsewhere, for this reason. What is the this, she asks. She notes it is assumed to be a report made to the Apostle Paul by Epaphras, who is believed to be the minister uh, of this group, uh, in verses that we saw there in verses 7 of 8 of last time's reading, which concerns the Colossian church, well, first of all, its existence, uh, and its success, and its struggles. Likely it was that report that triggered the need for this epistle, whether it was written by Paul or whether it was written by someone else later, she suggests. Others add 
This gave Paul, or Paul's school of disciples, a good reason to make sure that their ethical and theological doctrine was being properly communicated to this group. Clearly the author, the author of this letter, has offered thanksgiving to God in verses 3 through 8, but now shifts in these new verses to interceding on their behalf, that is Colossian people's behalf, to God. The understanding here, Dr. McDonald notes, is that was an apostle's charge or role or relationship with his congregation and the universal church of Christians. So Paul point, Paul's point is, we constantly pray for you Colossians. He wants them to know that he has their best interest at heart, says Dr. Thomas Obrick. Several scholars uh, comment that this whole section seems based on the Jewish power customs of early first century AD, with the comment praying without ceasing. This was a major concept in Judaism at this time. Jews each prayed at least twice a day, once upon rising and at bedtime. Those were individual prayers. Plus, there were daily temple prayers, especially in the afternoon session, always uh, at the time of sacrifice, taught Josephus in his history of the Jews. This was considered that process of that much praying was considered by the Jewish people to, to meet the requirement without ceasing. So that's the reference here, they believe. They prayed prayers of gratitude the morning and night to God for their salvation as enslaved people that their people have been and the blessing they now enjoyed as freed people. They saw all this history has that they have had has been bestowed on them by God and whatever they accomplished individually and as a people only happened by God's help. So they also requested future favors from God and that is what is happening here in verses 9 through 12 specifically to the uh, Colossians or if Colossians is a model church for all the churches then uh, to, to all of Christianity. The core of those favors was always to grant us knowledge of God's will. That was a Jewish custom, which can only come from God was their understanding. They requested understanding and discernment of wisdom and wisdom, which only God can grant and impart on us, they thought and taught. The understanding was one can get the information from observance or observation of man, but they believe only God grants wisdom, which allows one to truly discern and understand what's there and what God's will would be relative to that situation. Dr. McKnight teaches that we must appreciate today that Paul did not cease being a practicing Jew when he encountered Jesus Christ. No, he says, we see his uh, explanation of that in Romans clearly, that he came to conviction that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. Consequently, Paul simply reoriented his ex uh, existing uh, Jewish practices into what he refers to, what uh, McKnight refers to as a messianic, spiritual oriented or shaped uh, ecclesiastical uh, approach to, to uh, his teachings and his understanding. That Gentiles were to be offered the same inheritance as the Jews through this new Messiah or through this Messiah. And I might add, which the Jewish people had rejected, which is also a key part of that doctrine. Specifically here, Paul is asking that they be filled with knowledge of God's will through the Spirit, meaning both how it is obtained, how that Spirit, how that knowledge is obtained, 
and made manifest in them according to the Jewish writings of that day. In other words, the Jewish writings, not in the, in the, the Bible, but other Jewish writings that are found by scholars clearly point that that's, that was the Jewish uh, thinking of that day and time. Why? So you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord and pleasing to him in every respect. Exactly what Paul is referring to here, they say. Dr. Michael Byrd argues, they were to grasp that knowledge through spiritual means. That is, through the assistance of the Holy Spirit. Not through some uh, philosopher's mind or philosophical means that is involving the human mind. And thus would have been, that would have been a key teaching and a key argument point of the Judeo-Christian uh, peoples, if you will, in Paul's time where uh, Greek thought, Greek philosophy abound uh, continuing even in the Roman Empire, as well as there was also a Gnostic uh, school out there, which it's, it's not clear as to how much of that might have been an influence here, but several people bring it up as a possibility in their writings. Scholars generally interpret the Greek here as to living a life worthy of God. Walking is the word used as it implies you are walking in a Roman pagan world. That's the reality, but should visibly demonstrate your actions are fitting of God's will and Christian existence, teaches Dr. Mark McDonald. Dr. Bird adds, the true test of religion, of religious thinking, and of religious acquired knowledge, is if it, it is to be, it's to transform human behavior, and if it is, and it needs to be sustained. That is Paul's teaching here too, he says, and it is straight out of the Jewish beliefs, where they were taught to ask God for that knowledge of of his will so you will walk so you will behave in a way that's fitting of God's will and Paul calls on them to be thought be thankful towards God for it and take joy for that knowledge as it will allow us to share in the inheritance at the end of time that he refers to here uh, that the Saints will enjoy Paul is essentially taking this Jewish teaching and giving, giving it straight to the Christians. Audience, several scholars say, with that understanding that their Lord here is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is the one through whom the delivering deliverance of these Gentiles will come from darkness into light. It is clear here, Paul is aware that these people are under the influence of some other voice that is not teaching the Christian gospel that he teaches. So he reminds them to listen to their Lord, which is Christ, the one who has the power to deliver us out of darkness to the light. And that assured inheritance that the saints will enjoy uh, and understanding that he's saying this as an apostle as the emissary of Christ this illusion from darkness to light was uh, uh, traditionally used prior to Christianity in reference to uh, conversion of a Gentile to Judaism this was also an important concept that we see uh, throughout the Apocrypha writings and the Dead Sea Scrolls analysis of those Dead Sea Scrolls now clearly show that the uh, Dead Sea's Comroom community uh, had the same belief. Dr. Scott McKnight teaches that in the Greek, 
the gravity falls on the words worthy and walking. So here and in Galatians, Paul is drawing a deep line in the sand, he says. It is not the favor of fellow humans that you are trying to seek, but God's favor is the implied meaning here, he says. And such is explained even more clearly, much more clearly, in Galatians. The bearing fruit, several suggest, also implies that Christians have a personal growth and yield response and, and yield of that Christian faith responsibility. But is in verse eleven, it is clarified or expanded in my notes by being empowered means most likely, he says, God unleashes his spirit to Christians to empower them to be able to accomplish these things. He suggests the message here is through power, the Colossians need to live a life worthy of the Lord. Comes from, and that power comes from the glorious one is referred to here, that is from Christ, uh, the God that's described as some would say in the Gospels. They need that power to counter the power claim by the alternative sources of teaching that these people are encountering. They can't do it on their own, in other words, is the idea. They've got to have uh, the Lord, the blessing of the Lord uh, and the Holy Spirit to help them through this. That power will also give them patience and endurance. And so what does that mean? Well, persistence for one, but some would say buried in that based on thinking of first century would also be uh, patience not to retaliate. Paul, or whomever the author is, uh, in, now in verses 13 through 14, starts to digress into the redemption power of the Messiah, uh, notes McKnight. He and others suggest this really starts the next lesson's material, but most scholars do keep these two verses with the material covered here today. We will cover those two verses really with next week's with next lessons material uh, lesson number four it'll be uh, have much more in-depth comments on that but we do need to say a little bit here today because these two verses also serve as a transitional uh, two two verses between this material today and the material uh, next time in these two verses there is clearly further a further shift to something new, something different. From the Father to the Son also is a shift that's occurring. Most of what was said here today is centered on the Father, with some mention of Son, but it's going to shift, McDonald says, very clearly to the Son. She says the reference to deliverance is to recall the Exodus story of the rest of the rescuing by God of God's people from the darkness of Egypt into the light but it also serves as a very strong transference uh, she says in the role of Christ for these Gentiles your deliverance your redemption is through the cross is the metaphoric uh, implication here uh, for the forgiveness of sin is the redemption price that or the ransom price that was paid by Jesus on the cross to rescue you from the world's sins this is not the way however several scholars remind that this is a slightly different thinking than what we traditionally see taught by Paul in the undisputed Gospels uh, this is an expansion of that it goes a little further and so forth and so Hopefully this will give you some idea of what we'll be beginning to talk about in the next session. And I hope you have a good Bible study with these verses that we're dealing with here today. Have a good week.